Um, well, hello. This is uh, we're standing in my show, The Roots of Reason, and um, I'd like to just tell you a little bit about the show. First of all, I chose the title uh, to try to process a mental health issue that I was experiencing a few years ago, and uh, I experienced a, a head injury, and for a couple of years after that, I put my two then um, adolescent children through considerable hell. Um, and they're still recovering from that uh, time. So I started to paint trees specifically because I wanted to try to understand metaphorically what kind of madness would drive a mother to act in that way towards her children. I understood that it was the head injury. Medically, I received no intervention or help. In fact, the doctors or anyone I went near medically only seemed to make it worse. And I recognized that my behavior was head injury based, but you still tend to, well, I still tended to apply a certain logic to what I was doing. Now I understand there is no logic to a head injury, and I have forgiven myself. My sons are hopefully in the process of forgiving me. Metaphorically, I've always been attached to trees. They, uh, now I, I may be wrong, but the way I understand it, a tree's root system is the same width and depth as their branch system is wide and in height. So a tree, what you see above the ground is exactly what's mirrored below the ground. Um, I just, I get just shivers kind of even thinking about how profound that is an image for us as humans to contemplate on that a tree is its own root system. And in fact, if you flip them upside down, it's the same image. So I started to um, also want to explore the head injury and discover the roots of my madness. I wanted to find out exactly where did I end and the madness begin and this, this sort of thing. Parallel to that, I also have always had an incredible, um, as many people do, a credible attachment to Emily Carr and her trees. Um, this final tree, this was the last tree I painted in the series. And I was finally able, I felt, to go more into the shapes that she explored inside the tree, what, what grounded the tree, what shape was the tree all about, the spaces, the positive spaces and the negative spaces as well. So I decided last summer, and also, you know, feeling better, um, and also I had a car for the summer, so I thought, well, I'm going to spend the summer with the spirit of Emily Carr and the spirit of my own madness in Beacon Hill Park and paint on site. Now, the downside and the upside of that were the tourists. It, uh, a, a friend painted with me and we, we really realized very quickly we became as, ambas, ambassadors for Victoria. And it seemed to be an incredible thrill for people from, even from Victoria, but especially from other places to see what they used to say. We'd overhear them say, oh, a real artist, you know, painting, oh my, and they would just want to take our picture. and. I found that interrupted the process almost beyond what I could tolerate, but we, we worked really hard on being friendly. So we hope that anyone who sees this that perhaps met us in the park, and there were many, um, could forgive us if we might have been a little bit grumpy at times. <laughs> um, what I discovered is through my work with this show is if you don't take care of your root system, what you present to the, what I presented to the world was failing. I, I took myself back to Camosun College prior to last summer to delve into psychology, to learn the language of doctors, to try to interpret why they were treating me like some kind of attention seeking um, bored housewife, well, I'm not a wife anymore, but 
the, the, the demeaning quality to the mental health treatment that I was receiving was also adding to my trauma and my madness. I really have learned through studying these trees and developing my relationship with what they represent to me. Uh, there's just been an incredible, incredible level of healing. Um, I'd like to talk about this tree here, um, what I call tri octopi. I painted it on site in Beacon Hill, and uh, perhaps I'll just let you enjoy it for a moment. I decided to do it as a triptych and have some space. Gary Oaks are by far my favorite, favorite, favorite tree. They have a very shallow root system, so they're quite, to say they're important to Victoria is perhaps to say, um, you know, water is important to Venice. Like, their little fingers, their root systems grip to bare rock. And they are what, in some areas of Victoria, and, and particularly Saanich Peninsula, are all that's holding the um, ground in place to allow for other things to grow. Without the Gary Oaks, we would be whales. <laughs> so we would be barren. Um, they grip to anything. As far as mental illness and madness, this tree should be a symbol for that condition because they'll grow on next to nothing. And they're also drought resistant, to put it mildly. Um, they have a funny little thing called a gall wasp that lives in the tree. And in the fall, under the trees, if, especially if they're growing over a garden or pavement, you can actually see these little tiny mustard seed size balls all over the ground bouncing. And inside is a wasp that's being birthed and, and will pop, will drill a little hole and get out of that little tiny, tiny ball. There, there, there's endless things you can talk about when we, about Gary, Gary Oaks alone. I don't know who Gary was. Probably should look that up. Um, I originally did this tree on site in Beacon Hill with a more of a traditional gradation and, and blending and really correct shading and um, more of what we'll talk about in a moment, more of what cathedral looks like at the moment. But I gessoed it over and started over actually a week before this show because I just was being so normal and so appropriate and it just was not helpful at all in a lot. It was very similar to the way I found, how do I explain this? Um, dealing with the mental health system is very much like that. They really have very little to work with very much like a Gary Oak, except that they don't seem to know to how to use what they do have. Um, I mean no disrespect, I'm obviously there's some anger, but they try so hard to make people into some kind of normal and it's just not possible and it, it's a no-win situation. I'm not for them and not for someone who needs their help. When an artist gesso, gesso is a kind of a house paint, a white house paint product that you annihilate an old painting with. I, th I think most people use it to prep a canvas, but I use it as an annihilator. Um, when I catch myself being too appropriate with a painting, following the rules too closely, then it's time for the gesso and time to start, let it go. Another uh, huge part of healing, if from myself, from my mental illness, was letting go of a whole lot of preconceptions. I uh, started over, like I say, a week before the show, leaving the basic kind of trunk and tree bunches, or branch leaf bunches in, in place. But it, it, was, uh, it was some late nights getting ready. Um, and I, I wanted to show how the Gary Oak um, trunk is so chunky and, and there's little animals, you know, it's like a, 
the apartment building. It's just full of little life. And I also wanted to, to draw attention more to the, the strange aspect of the Gary Oak, the, the sort of gnarly finger look that they have when their leaves aren't, aren't in, in full, full swing. I painted it in the summer, so it was covered by a lot more leaves, which I decided to leave them out. Like, I kind of gave myself permission to do the painting I, I felt had to come out, not the painting I felt I was supposed to do. And um, a lot of people have mentioned when I started this jeweled effect of the, the bark leaving, of course, it's completely full of bark, but I, I thought, well, I'll leave the spine showing. And a lot of people have said it looked like an octopus, so that's where the name Trioctopi came from. I, I just think it looks jeweled. I, I'm not sure what it means anymore. It, once a painting is done, they go in my closet and I, I literally never see them again. So whatever I needed to do is gone and it's difficult to kind of explain what was resolved from doing that. This painting down here, was the first one I did. So, to me it has so many problems, I'm not even going to start with it, but um, you have to do the appropriate, perfect, rule-following pieces first. Well, I have to do the, the rough, kind of boring piece first. Um, other trees have just been important to me. This piece here was the first painting I ever did. And that was only um, eight years ago. It's in um, a garden here in Victoria out on the peninsula called Butchart Gardens. I'm sure a lot of people are familiar with it. The painting next to it is the view from the top of Beacon Hill Park across to Mount Baker in the United States. So it just had to be done because Mount Baker is we almost feel like we own it because people that live over there can't see it, but we can. And then the, a couple other pieces that I'd like to speak about. Cathedral was one of the ones where I did my best to stick to the rules. With one exception where the foreground of, of branches, I've, I wanted to, us to be able to see through to the shadows. In actuality, this is the cedars behind these are what I call tame cedars. Um, a tree like this and the one that we're going to see in a moment, those are wild trees. These are tame trees. These are in the park. And behind the sundial garden, there is no blue that shows. So I like that as a painter that I can fudge with the, the actual location. There's just buildings behind there. And I wanted the blue to ha force the trees to pop up. I also decided to go with what I call letterbox view, like in the movies, where they have the lo and long screen. There was just so many trees to cover. Quite often, it's just easier to take a, a portion and deal with that. Um, the paintings next to it, I painted this when I was a cook up north. It's actually mist rising from the cooling lakes and this is the sunrise, um, not my favorite time of day, but it was a very beautiful effect. And where I was at was about uh, 450 miles east of Yellowknife, um, just at the tree line, which was kind of neat because across the lake you can't see it, but there were the trees just get shorter and shorter until they disappear. And again, up here is another scene. I don't know if it shows without a reflection of Mount Baker from the Saanich Peninsula. Um, I ran this one in the Saanich Fair art show, but it didn't even.